This lecture is part of an online course on the theory of numbers and will be about Wilson's theorem. So I'll start off by stating Wilson's theorem. It just says that p minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 modulo p whenever p is prime. For example, we have 5 minus 1 factorial is 24, which is congruent to minus 1 modulo 5. Um, it's a simple example. And its proof is quite easy. What I'm going to do is just prove it for the case p equals 11 in a way that will hopefully make it obvious that this works for all primes. So we want to show that 10 factorial is congruent to minus 1 modulo 11. And for this we write down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10. So 10 factorial is the product of these numbers here. And now what I can do is I can pair them off in the following way. I'm going to pair off 2 with 6 because 2 times 6 is congruent to what is congruent to 1. In other words, these two numbers are inverses of each other. And similarly, 3 and 4 are inverses and 5 and 9 are inverses and 7 and 8 are inverses. So um, when we multiply these together, each each product of a number in its inverse just, just cancel out and give you 1. So 10 factorial is congruent to the product of the numbers left over, which is congruent to minus 1. And, and let's think about what numbers are left over. Well, these numbers are only left over if they're um, their own inverses. So we want a is congruent to a to the minus 1 modulo 11 or p or whatever. And this just says that a squared is congruent to 1. And this only has two roots because p is prime and the two roots are plus or minus 1. So, so in general, the same argument shows that p minus 1 factorial is congruent to 1 times p minus 1, which is congruent to minus 1 modulo p. Um, so um, Wilson's theorem turns out to be quite closely connected to primitive roots and we'll see several examples of it this lecture. So um, the first example is we can give another proof using a primitive root g and in this case the numbers 1, 2, up to p minus 1 are just g to the 1, g to the 2, up to g to the p minus 1 in some order. So the product is congruent to g to the 1 plus 2 plus, plus p minus 1, which is g to the p times p minus 1 over 2. And we, we'll take p to be odd because the case p equals 2 is trivial. And then we recall that g to the p is congruent to p, so this is just congruent to g to the p minus 1 um, over 2. And now we know that g to the p minus 1 is equal to 1. So g to the p minus 1 over 2 squared equals 1. So g to the p minus 1 over 2 must in fact be minus 1. So this is congruent to minus 1 modulo p. Um, um, so you can ask what happens, um, what about m minus 1 factorial for m not prime? So what is this mod p? Well, if m is not prime and m is not equal to 4, then m minus 1 factorial is congruent to 0 mod m. And, and this is easy to check. If m is equal to a, b with a, b um, um, co-prime, then we can see that m minus 1 factorial is divisible by a and by b because these, these are different. Sorry, these are co-prime. So m minus 1 factorial is congruent to 0. If m is not of the form a, b, then m must be of the form p to the k, and then it's an easy exercise that 
m minus 1 factorial is congruent to 0 mod m unless k equals 1 or m equals 4. So um, this gives one generalization of um, Wilson's theorem. Um, as an application of it, well, um, it's a big problem to find a really fast algorithm to check whether or not a big number is prime or not. And people put lots of effort into finding the best possible algorithm. What I'm going to talk about now is not the best possible algorithm, but what is possibly the worst possible algorithm, or at least the worst possible algorithm that anyone has ever suggested. So, so we have this algorithm. All we do is we calculate m minus 1 factorial mod m. And if the result is, is minus 1, it means the answer is prime or 4. And if the answer is naught, it's composite. Well, the problem here is that it's very difficult to calculate factorials mod some other number. So, so we can have the problem, what is n factorial modulo m for um, some numbers m and n. And of course, if n is reasonably small, you can just calculate it by multiplying them up. But, you know, suppose n and m are large, say they both have 50 digits or something like that. There seems to be no particularly easy way to calculate this in general. Um, I mean, if you could find such a method, it would, would give you a fast prime test. Um, I mean, we can do seemingly similar calculations. As, as we saw earlier, it's there's a fast algorithm for a to the n modulo m. So if we multiply n numbers that are all the same, there's a quick way to do it. But no one's ever found a quick way to, 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 to do that one. Um, so let's give an application of, of Wilson's theorem. So um, let's take p to be a prime. And we look at the numbers 1 times 2 times 3 times all the way up to p minus 1 over 2 times p plus 1 over 2 times p minus 1. So we're going to multiply all the numbers from 1 up to p minus 1. And then we're going to divide them into two equal groups. So we take these ones, which give us p minus 1 over 2 factorial. And these ones, well, you see, this is congruent to minus 1, minus 2, up to minus p minus 1 over 2. So the product is p minus 1 over 2 factorial times minus 1 to the p minus 1 over 2. And this product is equal to minus 1. So if we look at this, we see that p minus 1 over 2 factorial squared is equal to minus 1 to the p plus 1 over 2. Um, and um, this is equal to minus 1 if p is congruent to 1 mod 4 and plus 1 if p is congruent to 3 mod 4. So we now have this slightly funny result. If p is congruent to minus 1 mod 4, then minus 1 is a square mod p. In fact, it's the square of p minus 1 over 2 factorial. We can actually write down an explicit formula for this square root. Although, as I said, this explicit formula is totally and utterly useless because we can't calculate p minus 1 over 2 factorial very easily. Um, there are actually fast ways of calculating the square root of this that we'll mention later. Um, incidentally, um, as I said, Wilson's theorem is closely related to primitive roots. And you can also prove this, the fact that minus 1 is a square mod p using primitive roots. What we do is we take a primitive root and we notice that g to the um, p minus 1 is equal to 1. So if p minus 1 is divisible by 4, we have g to the p minus 1 over 4 squared is equal to g to the p minus 1 over 2, which is minus 1. So another way of calculating the square root is just to find a primitive root and raise it to the power of p minus 1 over 4. Um, so um, that's, that's one generalization of Wilson's theorem to things that are not primes, but it's not really a very satisfactory um, generalization. There's a better generalization due to Gauss. Gauss po pointed out that p minus 1 factorial mod p is equal to the product 
of all elements of Z modulo PZ that are, are co-prime to P. In other words, all elements of Z modulo PZ um, PZ star. So you remember this is this is all non-zero elements um, with, with, with within sorry all elements modulo P that of inverses. And we can ask the same question for any number n. What is the product over all numbers a such that a is co-prime to m of a? And we want to know what is this modulo m. So if we take m to be a prime, then this is just the product of all the numbers from 1 to p, and the answer is um, p minus 1 factorial. And Gauss showed that this number here is equal to minus 1 if um, m has a primitive root and it's equal to plus 1 otherwise. Um, um, in fact, this is a, um, um, a special case of uh, uh, several equivalences for a number, so the following are equivalent. So there are several conditions are equivalent. First of all, m has a primitive root. So that means a number g whose powers are all the um, um, residue classes modulo m with inverses. Um, and you, you can rephrase this in terms of abstract algebra by saying the group Z over MZ times is cyclic and it has G as a generator. That's really just a, an alternative way of saying that this group has a primitive root. Um, then the next condition that's equivalent to that is that there are at most N solutions to x to the n is congruent to 1 modulo m for any n. Um, and the third condition is that there are at most two solutions to a squared equals 1 modulo m. Um, or in other words, there's at most one element of order 2. Um, and the fourth condition is that um, Gauss's theorem that the product over um, all a co prime to m of a uh, is congruent to minus 1 modulo m. And the fifth condition is that m is equal to 1, 2, or 4, or p to the k, or 2p to the k for p an odd prime and k greater than or equal to um, 1. So um, here we have five different ways of characterizing the same slightly funny looking collection of integers. Um, well I'm not going to prove all bits of this in detail um, because uh, it's not particularly difficult but there are a lot of rather slightly fussy little details that I don't, I don't want to cover every single little detail because this would be a bit uninteresting, but I'm going to sort of sketch the main idea of the proof and you, sh you should be able to fill in any other details you want yourself. First of all, 1 implies 2 is easy because um, if we've got a primitive root, then saying x to the n equals naught um, is, is just the same as trying to solve, um, it's the same as trying to solve ny um, is equivalent to naught in z modulo phi of m z. Um, here where you write x is equal to g to the n for some primitive root n. So, so if m has a primitive root you can reduce this multiplicative problem to an additive problem um, modulo in, in some cyclic group which is easy to check. So, so this implication is an easy exercise. This implication here is completely trivial. 
um, this implication we sort of did earlier. You remember when we proved that 10 factorial is congruent to 1 modulo 11, all we used is the fact that it's only one um, element of order 2. Um, so, so this implication we've sort of already done. Um, this implication I'm going to sort of sketch later, but maybe not give complete details of it. Um, this implication that if there are at most two solutions to a squared equals 1, then m is one of these numbers, we, we, we did it earlier. Um, this implication here we did for primes but not for prime powers or, or things of the form two times a prime power. And I'll say a little bit about how you prove it for prime powers. Um, so um, if we've got um, a prime power, you can ask how can you find a primitive root? So, so, so let's have the following problem. Find a primitive root of p to the n, where, where p is odd. As, as we saw earlier, if p is equal to 2, then p to the n doesn't usually have a primitive root. So we've got to sort of explain, first of all, how you find a primitive root in this case. And secondly, we've got to sort of explain why this doesn't work for p equals 2. And the key point is that the number 1 plus p has order p to the n minus 1 in z over p to the n z star. And we can see this um, sort of by induction. So if I look at 1 plus p to the power of p, this is equal to 1 plus, now we're going to expand it by the binomial theorem, so we get p times p plus p choose 2 p squared plus various higher powers. And now we notice that everything here is divisible by p squared, sorry, by p cubed, as p is odd. So this is the point where we use the fact that p is odd. And why are we using that? Well, here we've got a p squared, and if p is odd, then this is divisible by p. Because it's got a p in the um, numerator, but no p's in the denominator. However, if p is equal to 2, then, th then there is a factor of p in the denominator, and this is no longer divisible by p. So we find that 1 plus p to the p is congruent to 1 plus p squared modulo p cubed. And similarly, we find 1 plus p to the p squared is congruent to 1 plus p cubed modulo p to the 4, and so on. And using these expressions here, it's quite easy to show that um, 1 plus p has exactly this order, modulo p to the n. Um, and now we can use that to show there's a primitive root modulo um, p to the n, and I'll just sketch this. So here we're going to find a primitive root modulo p to the n. So first of all, 1 plus p has order p to the n minus 1 in z modulo p to the n z star. Secondly, we can find some g of order um, p minus 1. And what we do is we take a primitive root mod p, and this as order will be p minus 1 times some constant um, modulo um, p to the n, because its order must be divisible by p minus 1, because there's order p minus 1 mod p. And now we, if we just raise it to the power of the constant, so raise it to this power, um, we, 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 we get something of order p minus 1. So we've got g of order p minus 1, and 1 plus p of order p to the n minus 1. Then, 1 plus p times g has order 
um, p minus 1 times p to the n minus 1. And the key point here is that these two numbers here are co-prime. So if we take um, two elements of co-prime orders and multiply them together, then we're going to get something whose order is their product. And this means that 1 plus p times g is a primitive root. Um, you notice that the hard part is in some sense finding a primitive root modulo p. So there's no easy way to write down a formula for, for the primitive root modulo p that I know of. But it's easy to write down an explicit element of order p to the n minus 1. It's just 1 plus p. And of course there are lots of others. And um, um, from this um, we, we can lift our primitive root modulo p to a primitive root modulo p to the n. So that's a sort of sketch of why there's a primitive root modulo p to the n. Um, we should say, what about 2? Well, in that case, if we take n equals 3, 1 plus 2 does not have order um, 2 squared modulo 2 cubed. This is order 2, so, so this definitely breaks down. Um, instead we get a slightly different result. So we find 1 plus um, 2 squared has order um, 2 to the um, 2 to the n minus 2 modulo 2 to the n. You see if it, if it were a primitive root it would have order 2 to the n minus 1, but we can't achieve order 2 to the n minus 1, and this is the best we can do. And this number is, of course, 5. So this is pretty close to being a primitive root. It sort of misses by a factor of 2. And what we find, in fact, is that every element mod 2 to the n, that is 1 mod 4, is a power of 5. And every element is of the form that's co-prime uh, co to 2, is of the form plus or minus 5 to the n for some n. So 5 just misses being a primitive root because you also have to throw in a sign. Um, so um, what this does is it gives us a complete description of what the group Z modulo MZ star is for any M. And you describe, we can describe this group as follows. First of all, we write M as a product of primes, so P1 to the K1 times P2 to the K2. And then as we saw earlier, Z over MZ star kind of splits as a product Z over P1 to the K1 star times Z over P2 to the K2 star and so on. So we can reduce the case of prime power order and then we saw that for prime power order z over p to the k z times is isomorphic to z modulo p to the k minus 1 times p minus 1 z if p is odd because um, a primitive root just gives an isomorphism between these. And this is, this is a cyclic group with one generator, so it's easy to, to um, work with. And finally, z over 2 to the kz star is isomorphic to z modulo 2z, where this is given by the sine plus or minus 1, times z over 2 to the k minus 2z, where this is given by powers of 5. Um, that's provided k is um, um, greater than or equal to 2, of course. So k is equal to 1, then this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so um, we, we have a complete description of what this multiplicative group is. Um, I'll just finish by saying a little bit about... Um, uh, an, another leftover problem we had, which says that if there are greater than or equal to four solutions to x squared equals 1 mod m, then the product over a m um, 
a being co prime to m of a is just one modulo m. Um, in fact, um, this is actually a special case of what happens if you take the product of all elements of any finite abelian group. The product is one unless there's a unique element of order two, in which case the product is the unique element of order two. And anyway, we're just really doing this case here. And as before, we see the product is equal to the product of all elements of order two. Um, so what we've got to do um, is um, let's form a group H, which is all elements of order one or two. Um, so this is a finite abelian group. And if we've got a finite abelian group, all of whose elements have order one or two, then the product of all elements is always one unless there are only two elements in the group. So we can say if H has more than two elements, the product over all elements of H of A is equal to one. And I'm going to cheat a little bit in proving this by quoting some results about vector spaces, which I'm not quite sure if they really count as a prerequisite of this course, but since this is just a sort of minor comment, I don't think this really matters. What we can do is we can say H is isomorphic to a vector space over a field with two elements. So this is the field with two elements, zero and one. It's, it's just sort of binary arithmetic, sort of, as used on a computer. And if we've got a vector space over the field with two elements, we can easily figure out what the sum of all the elements is as follows. Notice we're using sums rather than products because we've changed the group operation to addition. So if it's the dimension is naught, then there's only one element, which is zero. If the dimension is one, then we can write the two elements as naught and one and the sum is non-zero. If the dimension is two, then um, we, we choose a basis and we get four elements of the vector space. And you can see the sum of these is just naught. And if there are eight elements in dimension three, then we get zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, one, one. And again, you can check the sum is zero. And now I'm going to leave it as an easy exercise that if you've got a vector space over a field with two elements of dimension at least two, then the sum of all elements in it is zero. And that proves the theorem that the product of all elements modulo m is one mod m as long as m has at least four square roots of one. Okay, I think that's enough variations of Wilson's theorem.